And uh, allow me now to go uh, for the second uh, speaker in today's session. It's my honor uh, and pleasure to introduce uh, uh, him um, to this session. Our second speaker will be Dr. Amr Hani Safwat. He is the current head of anesthesia and intensive care department in three top hospital in Maldives. Uh, and he is the previous head of Ghassan Faraon Hospital in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Dr. Amr graduated, graduated in Ain Shams University in 1994. He earned his Master of Science in Ain Shams University in 1998 and got his MD uh, back in 2006. Uh, Dr. Amr's main interest is critical care and neuroanesthesia. So uh, we are watching now an expert talking uh, about one of the most hot topics again in uh, real ICU life and again in exams, pneumonia in ICU settings. So thanks, Dr. Amr, uh, for joining us today. It's our pleasure really to join us. Uh, Dr. Amr, uh, okay, please go ahead and start your presentation. Yes. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you uh, to share some of the topic that we need all to discuss. Uh, first, I would like to express my uh, great gratitude and thanks to the organizing committee, Dr. Walid Habashi, Dr. Hisham Abdul Masood, and Dr. Uh, Walid Aswa, plus, of course, our dear friend, Dr. Saad Mahdi. Uh, and uh, I would express my, um, it's very difficult now to give a presentation after the marvelous presentation giving, uh, given for by Dr. Adil, which was uh, something that we all should uh, sit and read it and listen to it many times. So if we are going to speak about pneumonia in the ICU, why we should speak about pneumonia in the ICU? Pneumonia is the most common cause of infectious disease-related death in the ICU. So it's very important to discuss it, to know how to diagnose it, to manage it, and it should be taken, any pneumonia patient should be taken seriously, and we should try as much as possible to go systematically and to reach a proper diagnosis and a proper treatment. An estimated number of 40 to 60% of patients with pneumonia who present to the ER will need hospitalization. 10% of this group will need an ICU care. Community-acquired pneumonia that is severe enough to cause hospitalization, the mortality rate is around 12 to 22% for patients and for patients who require ICU admission and can reach 55% for elderly patients who requires ventilation. So we are facing a serious problem that needs very good care. Also, hospital-acquired pneumonia, HAP, and ventilator-associated pneumonia, VAP, are major contributors to morbidity and mortality. What's community-acquired pneumonia? It is defined as the development of a lower respiratory tract parenchymal infection in an outpatient setting. So if you are called to the ER to check a patient with pneumonia. What will be the criteria of how to treat him? Many cl classification have been suggested to decide how to admit and treat the patients and we'll discuss some of them. The most simple is CURB 65 criteria. This is a very simple criteria that guides you how to treat the patient. So if the patient is confused, you have one point. If his BUN is above 20, another point. If his respiratory rate is more than 30 per minute, that's a third point. Systolic blood pressure is below 90 or diastolic below 60, that's a fourth point. And the age is above 65. What we will do at that time? If we have curb zero to one, we can treat him as an outpatient. Curb two, considered short stay in the hospital for close observation, and we can discuss IV antibiotics. CURB 3 to 5 requires hospitalization with high possibility of ICU admission. Another classification was <clears throat> suggested as the fine pneumonia severity index, which is having more criteria and more uh, calculations. I think this is, it will be in the slides 
we can, you can all go through it so we can not take very long time. After we calculate the score of the, this severity index, we'll categorize the patients into five classes. Class one, which has score of less than 51 points, or class two, less than 70 points, can be managed as outpatient with a mortality rate of less than 1%. Class three with 71 to 90 points can be managed either in the inpatient or outpatient setting with also a mortality rate. Class four needs hospitalization from 91 to 130 with a higher mortality rate of 9.3. Class five, which is more than 130 points need ICU admission with a high mortality rate of 27%. So as long as we are going in more points and more classes, our in, uh, mortality rate is getting higher and our level of care is increasing. In 2007, the American Thoracic Society defined the criteria of severe community acquired pneumonia that needs ICU admission as one major or three minor criteria of the following. The major criteria are the need of mechanical ventilation or the presence of severe sepsis needing vasopressors with pneumonia. The minor criteria are low systolic blood pressure, low oxygenation, higher respiratory rate, multilobar invasion, confusion, uremia, low, low total exocytic count or low platelet count or hypothermia. So if we go back to the curve, you'll find this is the nearly the same points that were discussed before. <clears throat> so now we decided what are the criteria of admission and where is the best place for admitting a patient with pneumonia? So now we will put the patient either in the inpatient department or in the ICU according to his condition. So what is hospital acquired pneumonia? Hospital acquired pneumonia is the development if, of pneumonia more than 48 hours after hospital admission and excluding any pulmonary infection that was incubating at the time of admission. That means that I have to be sure that to define HAP or hospital acquired pneumonia, that the patient had, hadn't got any pulmonary infection at the time of admission. What's VAP, which is ventilator associated pneumonia? This is HAP that develops in a patient who is receiving mechanical ventilation. Each day in a patient, a patient is intubated, increases the crude rate of VAP by one to 3%. Some authors now want to refer this to not ventilator associated pneumonia, but intubation associated pneumonia, which makes sense because this is very less in patient receiving non-invasive ventilation. What's the pathogenesis of VAP? The patient typically develops pneumonia after microaspiration of organisms contained in the oropharyngeal secretions. It's clear that microaspiration through the uh, oropharyngeal secretion can cause this one. The presence of the ETT will make the natural defense mechanism of the host as the intact glottis or cough reflex bypassed by the presence of the artificial airway. So the tube itself is one of the major causes of VAP. The ETT can also become the site of development of a biofilm which can contain a big amount of mi microorganisms causing infection. So, when the patient is coming with pneumonia, what is the clinical picture that we are seeing? Cough, dyspnea, sputum, pleuritic chest pain, fever or hypothermia, and confusion in elderly. What is the microbiology that we'll see for community acquired pneumonia, streptococcus pneumonia, Mycoplasma pneumonia, Legionella speeches, Haemophilus infection, viral infections up to 30%, which is now getting increased with the COVID era. <clears throat> there are many types of streptococcus pneumonia, where, where some of them are very invasive and can cause uh, cavitation and uh, severe infection. The Organism, what are the organisms on, in the cap that needs ICU admission? Usually it's Streptococcus, Legionella, 
Haemophilus influenza, Staphylococcus, and Mycoplasma. So we have to try as much as possible when we admit patients with pneumonia to check and determine the kind of organism that we are dealing with, because each kind of organism has special treatment and special way of approach. What are the common organisms that we will see in hospital acquired pneumonia? Enteric gram negative bacteria and staphylococcus. In cases of VAP ventilator associated pneumonia, we have to differentiate between two stages. The early onset VAP, which is less than four days of ventilation, usually they are simple organisms, or an usually single organisms, simple and single. During late onset of VAP, we are having more strong organisms and we are expecting multiple organism infection can occur in half of the cases. So how to diagnose severe community acquired pneumonia, HAP and VAP? As usual, the investigation that we should do to any patient, chest X-ray, CT scan if needed. Please remember to take two sets of blood culture and sputum culture before giving an antibiotic as much as we can. Full blood count, blood chemistry, LDH, procalcitonin, ABG, urin urinary antigen, antigen for Legionella and pneumococcus in suspected cases, bronchoscopy in indicated cases. And please consider any patient with a respiratory rate above 30 as a severe case. So we, upon our reading for this investigations and upon our, in, our uh, reading for the investigations and the x-rays, we can discuss how to proceed in the treatment and management. So these are few x-rays showing pneumonia. As we see here, it can vary from one whole lung to a loop. This X-rays should be done on regular basis, on admission, and on timely intervals as the, according to the protocol of the institute we are working in. Please don't over request chest X-rays and don't under request them. You have to have a clear protocol about requesting X-rays for the patients with pneumonia, because usually, the radiological improvement is a little bit delayed than the clinical improvement. So how to treat? Cases of community acquired pneumonia. If an outpatient with no comorbidities, I can give a macrolide or the doxycycline. Outpatient with cardiopulmonary disease, I will go for beta-lactam or doxycycline or fluoroquinone. In patient not admitted in the ICU, I can give azithromycin. In patient with cardiopulmonary disease, I can give beta-lactam and either macrolide or doxycycline. This is one group or fluoroquinolone alone. ICU patient, we usually start with beta-lactam IV plus either a macrolide or fluoro fluoroquinolone. If there is a risk of pseudomonas, anti-pseudomonal beta-lactam and amino lactoside plus either macrolide or fluoroquinolone. For each hospital, usually there is an antibiogram and uh, common organisms detected in the community. So be guided with this to give the empirical antibiotic that we will talk about now. Treatment for patient with HAP or VAP. So we should start with initial empirical antibiotic that would include anti-pseudomonal phallosporin with or without an amino glycoside or fluorokine. Other regimens, anti-pseudomonal penicillin or beta-lactam with amino glycoside, carbapenem with or without amino glycoside or fluorokinolones, fluorokinolones with or without amino glycosides or anti-pseudomonal phallosporin, azithromycin and amino glycoside. If we suspect MRSA, so we can use vancomycin or linezolite. 
if associated MRSA toxins production at clindamycin along with vancomycin. If suspected, Ligonella use macrolides or fluoroquinones. These are, as I said, the empirical antibiotics suggested by some institutes. Please follow your local guidelines for uh, starting the medication. You have to take blood cultures before starting the antibiotic and to be guided accordingly. The current guidelines support a shorter duration of antibiotic therapy, five to 10 days. It's important to assess a clinical response after 48 to 72 hours of treatment. If there's a clinical improvement, antibiotic can be tailored or decelerated based upon both culture results or clinical response. If there's clinical improvement and all cultures are negative, the patient should be evaluated to determine if there's any non-infectious cause and antibiotics should be stopped. So not all patients with fever and cough and are due to pneumonia. We have to decide the cause and work accordingly. Why some patients will not respond to our treatment? Failure to improve despite appropriate empirical therapy is defined as either continued rapid deterioration one to two days after the start of antibiotics or failure to improve after seven days. What are the risk factors for treatment failure? Patient with liver disease, patient with leukopenia, high uh, uh, pulmonary index score, pneumonia index score, pleural effusion or cavitary diseases. All this can make the resistant uh, disease with difficult to treat. What are the predictors of mortality in severe pneumonia? Severe pneumonia, if with an old age, if with coexisting diseases, if with severe clinical picture like high respiratory rate, like hypotension, like extremes of temperature, like disturbed level of consciousness in elderly, and with severe variations or extremes of total exceeded count, decreased oxygenation, high carbon dioxide, starting of renal impairment, low hemoglobin, decrease of pH than 7.35, chest X-ray showing more than one lobe involvement or cavitary or pleural effusion, or evidence of shock, sepsis, and organ dysfunction, all this will give us a big warning that our patient is going on the difficult pathway and with a high risk of mortality. How to prevent severe pneumonia? Neemococcal vaccines play an important role in preventing the development of respiratory complication in high-risk adults. Simple and most cost-effective method of preventing hospital-acquired pneumonia is to inform force a strict and hand washing policy and the universal practice of blood and fluid precautions. Again, hand washing. Uh, I think now we are all very fed up of hand washing <laughs> advices. Secondary and resistant infection may be curated if to avoid necessary antibiotics and tailor and decelerate antibiotic use. Please don't abuse the antibiotics. Go according to the cultural sensitivity, go according to the local guidelines, so we, can, we will decrease the uh, prevalence of resistant organisms. Head up elevation, decrease the duration of incubation as much as possible, selective digestive decontamination or topical oral decontamination, and thromboembolism prophylaxis should and must be started. So this is a very brief uh, presentation about pneumonia. If I... Uh, anyone needs uh, some printout or handouts, I will give it to Dr. Sham and he can post it in the group. And again, uh, thank you very much and I wish you all the best. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Dr. Amr, and thanks a million, Dr. Uh, Adel Hussain. Uh, I'll start to open uh, the Facebook page to take the questions from there. 
I have seen a couple of questions. Let's start with for Dr. Adel Hussein. So the first question is, what is the role of uh, central venous pressure during hemodynamic monitoring? Is it important or not? Um, and the second question, what's the difference between fluid responsiveness and fluid tolerance? Um, Thank you, Dr. Walid. Uh, very important questions. I uh, will go forward. The first one, which is the role of uh, central venous saturation um, or mixed venous saturation, if we were to be more precise. So, what's the difference between central and mixed? I think it's clear for all of us that central is from uh, RA or the right atrium, if you have a central venous catheter. Or mixed is from pulmonary capillary, you should have uh, the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure. This is the difference between mixed and the central. So, because some people, they are mixing between uh, both, which is the difference between central and mixed. And of course, uh, there is a difference of about 5% uh, in the targets. So, central venous saturation target should be more than 70%. Uh, as a surrogate or as a uh, end resuscitation tool or uh, evaluation uh, uh, parameter or cutoff. Uh, Max venous hydration 65 because it's from the uh, pulmonary capillary, so it's lower by five. Uh, and um, what's its role? Uh, this is, was an area of debate since long time comparing the center venous saturation with other uh, resuscitation parameter. So first, its role was in the diagnosis, uh, if your patient have hypoperfusion uh, or not, uh, plus uh, its role in the resuscitation endpoints. Uh, but to come about with the uh, with the references compare or, or the the evidence evidence space that, that we have it, as we mentioned, it has now a poor correlation uh, for uh, assessment and as an end uh, point tool. So do not rely, as we mentioned, for example, if you you have lactate now, some of references now they are preferring the lactate right, over right. the central venous saturation, and if you look for the uh, uh, six references compare or the, the evidence space that we have, as we mentioned, it has now a poor correlation. There is an echo in, in, in your sound. One second, I will. Okay, it's sorted now, so go ahead, please. So if you, uh, you are going to use uh, one of those tools, usually they were locking in the evidence base uh, in the past, is it lactate or center venous saturation? Now coming or uh, reviewing the surviving sepsis campaign, for example, they are relying on the serum lactate, not the central venous saturation uh, as a, a diagnostic or incorporating tool in the criteria of uh, diagnosis plus uh, resuscitation endpoints. Uh, again, if you don't have the lactate, for example, at a time, you can rely on, but remember it's not uh, a specific, not sensitive, has a poor correlation for many contributing factors. Uh, especially if a patient is in, in vasopressors, if a patient is having high FIE2 uh, event, for example, so it's not uh, compared to, to the lactate. So do not rely on the central venous saturation alone. Uh, it's having a poor correlation as a surrogate compared to uh, the serum lactate to the evidence that we have it in our hands uh, currently. Uh, for the difference between fluid responsiveness and fluid uh, tolerance. So for, for the term is, is totally different. Fluid responsiveness, it means that you are asking yourself, is my patient, is, uh, if I will give him fluids, that he will uh, respond in terms of that he will uh, increase uh, the cardiac output uh, by 10% or whatever the cut off for 15. So this is the, uh, this is why I'm giving the fluids, uh, or I am I'm giving what whatever the time. Usually we are recommending the the balanced uh, uh, crystalloids, but this is the answer when to give fluids and why I'm giving fluids. This is the term of the European is fluid responsive or not. And this is a very common question for any crashing patients. You have to ask your patient, as I mentioned, uh, ICU patients. So I'm different than the trauma, different than the ER patient, but at least for ICU patients, as I showed in my presentation, about 50% of them are fluid responsiveness. But you have to answer this question precisely. Not, do not rely on the CVB measurements, 
rely on something more precise in your hand, as we mentioned, dynamic indices, because underestimation, sorry, underestimation has a drawbacks and overestimation also has drawbacks. So flow resuscitation is an important answer. We have to have a tool that will tell you exactly, precisely, my patient is flow responsive, uh, responsive or, or not. While on the other hand, fluid tolerance, uh, now for how long should I maintain my patient uh, on, on such fluid resuscitation? Uh, for example, initially, if I am using PLR, which is a passive degrees with many fluid challenges, there is a protocol, we call it many fluid challenges. This is not for fluid tolerance. This is, it will tell you my patient is fluid responsive, I will give fluid. But how much fluid you will give? 10 cc per hour, 20, 30, 40, 50 cc per hour, this is the fluid tolerance. How his heart will tolerate, how the preload will tolerate, how his kidneys, uh, kidney perfusion will tolerate. Then when to stop, this is the tolerance part of uh, the question. When to stop is the, uh, how, uh, for how long you will tolerate. Uh, very good, Radel. Uh, I think it's clear. Is there any rule for central venous pressure or IVC diameter and index as both are static parameters in resuscitation of shock? I, I, I agree with you. Those uh, questions, commonly we, 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 we were asked about those static uh, parameters. Uh, type. Nowadays, uh, we are telling that uh, those static parameters are not um, specific and we are not relying on the static uh, parameters. All the guidelines or the recommendations rely on the dynamic and dynamic because it's, it's from its term, it's dynamic. It's not, it's telling you how is the variability can occur. Static, it's like the stand is still. It's, it's, a, it's a just one, one reading now, but uh, Important with the static, which I like, it, is the trend. If you are, if you want to rely on the CVB, do not rely on one reading. Please rely on the trend of rise. For example, uh, CVB will start was five, then seven, then eleven, then fifteen, then twenty. So the trend is very important. And some people, exactly during the resuscitation, even they use the femoral line, though it's not in the right atrium, but they use it for readings from the femoral line. If you have a CVB, for example, sorry, central venous line during the resuscitation or cardiac arrest, and there is no need, uh, sorry, no time now to replace it with IG or subclavian. So you can use, but use the trend, please. For example, the initial measurement was from the femoral line was 10. So some people you can, yes, you can rely if you don't have a dynamic uh, parameter. Uh, so use it, but use with, uh, with trend. Do not use single reading even for the central venous pressure. Until now, we are relying on CVB because a lot of variabilities, if the patient is ventilated, the PEEP effect, the, uh, the strain, the tricuspid regurg. So it's not, uh, uh, I'm talking about the CVB. So it's not the, 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 the precise tool to, to rely on the fluid responsiveness. Concerning the IVCs, again, as you mentioned, Dr. Ali, it's a, it's a static, but uh, again, number or the diameter, uh, we are not relying on. If you're asking me, so I would like to use the IVC, so use it in uh, collapsibility and distanceability indices. So this is well tell you importantly, uh, or precisely uh, about the IVC. So IVC per se, no, I do not recommend, but Combine it if your patient is uh, ventilated. So this is, we call it distensibility index. Maybe I don't like, uh, I don't highlight it in, in, in my presentation, but maybe in, in, in certain uh, time in, in the future, we may highlight uh, a, a, a lecture about those indices. I think it's an era we can highlight what exactly does it mean uh, static? What, what exactly uh, does it mean uh, dynamic? What's the references behind it? But again, for IVC, I, if I, uh, I'm, I'm advising uh, to use, use please for collapsibility and distensibility and, and this is for spontaneously breathing and mechanical ventilated patients respectively. Perfect, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Adel. It, it, it's really very comprehensive answers on the question as well. Uh, we can uh, never be uh, like satisfied enough with uh, your answers on the question. So we, 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 we keep asking, we want to listen all the time 
to yourself answering the questions. You like very comprehensive. Thanks very much. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Amr Safat. He's he just broke his fast like 15 minutes ago, so this is his breakfast time. Actually, thanks for joining us during this time. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, there's no questions uh, from from uh, the Facebook page uh, uh, fellowship group, but I have a question myself. When you start to suspect that the pneumonia is fungal pneumonia, what are the criteria? Do you check for uh, uh, beta D glucans? What, what do you do in your unit? There is a very easy approach for this thing. Febrile neutropenic patient. Okay. You sus suspect fungal infection. Usually the patient who will not respond to proper antibiotic therapy, then let's say 72 hours of like this, uh, he should be suspected for uh, fungal. We are, we are sending uh, culture for fungal, fungal blood culture on admission. Problem that it takes some longer time than expected. So we are uh, depending on uh, the clinical improvement for the antibiotic therapy or no. Is there any time frame like if you start the patient on four days, five days, seven days, two weeks on antimicrobials, then you start no. to add antifungals? Usually we are starting after the fifth day with no improvement. Fifth day, perfect. Yes. Okay. Uh, COVID-19 is like, this is the era of COVID-19 and I knew from yourself uh, before going live that you have like 16 or 18 patients intubated, yes. ventilated uh, COVID. Uh, what is proning uh, benefit in COVID and non-COVID pneumonias. So I know it's still under investigations for COVID, uh, particularly in spontaneously breathing, non-intubated patients, but do you prone patients uh, like non-COVID for spontaneously breathing uh, or after intubation? Definitely you are doing both. We are proning the uh, pre-ICU set setting. We're proning the patients they, and we are observing that they are hypoxic, but a week, happy hypoxia, happy and hypoxia. it yes, and it's it's getting good results. And our intubated patients, we are definitely proning them, and really it's uh, beneficial because what we observed in our uh, small uh, number of patients, which are uh, is still very small to make a proper diagnosis or proper judgment, that most of them after intubation they're becoming uh, hypercapnic too much. The CO2 is rising to very high levels. So what we are doing for this are two uh, things that we are trying to do. Number one is to, to decrease the uh, ventilation perfusion mismatch. So we are proning the patient and we are decreasing the dead space, the tubings and with the catheter mounts and we are removing everything. And really this two were beneficial in uh, around two patients or three patients who are now extubated before doing this maneuvers, their CO2 was reaching 100 and 120 millimeter mercury. And after this two maneuvers, there was dramatic uh, improvement in the carbon dioxide. Well done. Well done. That's, that's very good. So uh, the last question here, I know that uh, the guidelines currently is uh, prone, don't oscillate. Uh, but if proning is not beneficial for the patient and you're struggling to oxygenate him, What's your rescue after that? Do you have ECMO? Do you send him over uh, with we, Medivac or something? So what's your un, last result? Un, un, unfortunately, we are having ECMO, but not in our hospital. It's, I told you that Maldives is not a very developed country. We are having ECMO, one ECMO machine in the whole country. So, um, which is not bad, which is not bad. At least you have an, bad, an ECMO. Yes, we, have, we have a backup. Until now, fortunately, we did not need to use it. All our patients are still in the, in, in the uh, stage of, yes, they are hypo sometimes hypoxic, but not the refractory hypoxia that needs ECMO until now. Okay, perfect. So stay safe, everybody. Thanks very much uh, again. Thank you so Father much. Hussain, uh, Eid Mubarak uh, for you, for all of you. Uh, may Allah accept our prayers and our fasting. And uh, all of us reach Eid uh, safely. Uh, so uh, for our vultures and attendees, uh, thanks very much, uh, Dr. Hisham Ahmed. Uh, 
thanks a million he joined us today uh, unfortunately dr uh, saad mahdi was in actually in a meeting uh, in limerick university hospital he wasn't all able to join us uh, uh, before we finish um, we hope to see you back soon uh, in another topic uh, and hope to tolerate us in more questions and uh, see you next session inshallah assalamu alaikum thank you so much thank you so much thank you so much Thank you. 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 Thank you.